Hello, my name is Terry Meir and I'll be your host today. Uh, all of us at Sustainable Kashi are proud to provide these free classes to help us all learn ways of living more connected with our ecosystems. Uh, you can learn more about our project at sustainablekashi.com. If you have any questions today, we'd love you to type them in the chat box. And today's question for you is, what is your favorite native plant? So if you could just go ahead and type in uh, where you're from and what your favorite native plant is. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to talk about it. Uh, today, we're really lucky, lucky to have uh, Sarah Piotter with us. She's an educator from the ELC uh, for over six years. The ELC is the Environmental Learning Center uh, here in Indian River County. Uh, Sarah has worked for the Nature Conservancy, the North Carolina Museum of Natural Science, and the United States Geological Survey, which is very exciting to me. And I'd love to hear more about that job. Uh, Sarah is a certified interpretive guide through the National Association of Interpretation. She's a project learning tree instructor and a certified forest therapy guide. Oh my goodness, what a res resume. <laughs> Sarah, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today to talk about native plants. That's one of my passions in my heart. So I'm, I'd, love to, I'd love to sit here and geek out on plants with you uh, this morning. Thank you very much for being here. Oh, thank you for inviting me. And ELC is happy to be here supporting Kashi. Um, I could also dork out on native plants all day. So when you asked me to do this, I was like, yeah, uh, does it have to be only an hour? So absolutely like happy to be here. Um, and to see everybody. I saw some comments coming through. Hopefully we see some, some of your favorite natives um, and we'll talk about them too. So um, like Terry said, I'm with the Environmental Learning Center. In the back, you can kind of see, we have some um, sketches of plans for even um, you know, bringing more out to the ELC. So lots of plans for the future. And we'll talk a little bit about that today because I'm not sure if you're familiar with the ELC. Um, but first, I want to just talk a little bit about me. Terry, thank you for that great introduction. Let's see. Are we? Oh, there we go. Okay. So I'm an educator here at the ELC. I've been here for a while. I worked for the ELC like a decade ago and decided I wanted to go out and do field work, which brought me to the USGS. I worked with um, the North Carolina State Museum and U the University of um, North Carolina doing a lot of bird studies. Uh, birds are kind of one of my other passions and uh, I just had a lot of fun, but I totally missed education. I missed sharing my love of nature with other people and having their conversations inspire me. And so decided to leave um, research and get back into education. And um, Florida is my home. I grew up here. So uh, I feel like uh, the ELC is kind of my second home when I'm not at my actual home. Um, so ELC, I have been here uh, for a while. And normally, if you have a question about birds, butterflies, plants, they're going to send uh, those questions to me. It is truly like one of my loves. Um, outside of native plants, I do like to garden. So I have a lot of indoor plants that take a ton of my time. Um, and I wanted to share with you just a quick story about how I came to love native plants. When I was younger and I was in college, I was attracted to, you know, the animals, those really like charismatic, bright, beautiful birds. And I had a vegetation course and I just... <laughs> was not at all interested in plants. We went out and did these great field activities. Um, we were out learning in the uh, longleaf pine systems and I wanted like nothing to do with it, um, which is a little embarrassing to say. But I think as I've matured, I've really uh, learned to appreciate that without these plants, we don't have the birds, we don't have the insects um, and we don't even have some of the, you know, marine mammals that Florida is so well known for. So uh, I grew to really having no interest in plants and now I'm pretty much obsessed. 
And now that you know a little bit about me, I just wanted to introduce you to ELC. So as you can see, our mission is all about education, inspiring people. And that's a big, I guess, I guess goal, right? To connect people, to have people be inspired, to be a better steward and to take care of themselves too. And so how does the ELC accomplish this? For, for us, it's all about making connections. And we do that by offering um, our community this great land. We're on uh, 64 acres of mangrove island full of native plants. And it's a great place for people to come and learn about Florida coastal environments. And of course, native plants and all of the great wildlife associated with those plants. Our area, this lagoon that we're, we're sitting in the middle of is home to like an oppressive number of animals. It's about 21, 2200 species of plants and about uh, 20, I think it's like 2000 uh, species of wildlife. So that could be macro invertebrates all the way up to manatees. Um, our lagoon and the health of this system is just critical to our livelihood in this community. Um, it brings in tons of tourist dollars. And of course, we all know if you're here, that the health of the environment is directly related to our health. So we do like to have people out to our campus. We're open seven days a week. So you can come out and explore and learn. And of course, take care of yourself by being in nature. Um, just a quick uh, intro to our history. We were founded by really progressive environmental stewards that were kind of ahead of their time in some ways. So George Bunnell, um, Maggie Bowman, and Holly Dill, which was our original executive director. She um, really has spearheaded and drove ELC in the direction that we're moving today of looking at our past, but also looking ahead to make sure that these precious resources were surrounded by protected for years to come. Those uh, founders knew that we needed a place to have um, education about our great environment here and to make sure that these resources were around long enough for our children, our grandchildren and future generations. And one of the things that we really try to promote is, of course, personal action is very important, but as a community, um, inspiring our neighbors, our family, our maybe our schools or our religious groups to be stewards, to learn more. And once you learn to take action, so moving that knowledge into a step of action um, to create a whole band of environmental educators. I'm not just an educator. You guys, everybody in this room is an educator right now. So really take that power and um, learn to spread that to, to help people fall in love with our natural resources. So our presentation today is how we can focus on being better stewards of the earth, specifically Florida, by looking at uh, these environments through our native plants and landscapes, which are quite varied. So to give you a little idea of where we're going today, we'll discuss some common terminology related to plants and their communities. I'll talk about the impact of natives, why are natives so important? Uh, how are they specifically important to Florida? And then uh, a few slides to talk about how to get started. What are some good natives um, that you can plant today? And of course, saving time, I uh, would love to hear your questions. So please feel free um, at the end of the presentation, we'll have some time to talk. So I was asked by Kashi and uh, Terry and Amy to give a talk on the series related to permaculture. And permaculture, I'm sure you guys know, but just being really clear with that definition is that intentional planting um, and plants that you're sustaining that um, are helping 
uh, you to be more sustainable, but are also encouraging, uh, you know, community with the natural environment. So for ELC, we don't typically grow plants for food or generally for beauty. We're growing them because they have great uh, impact on our natural systems and function of uh, processes that we want to maintain. So I think this wheel of the 12 principles of permaculture is really um, just like a great thing to refer to. I wish more people knew about this because there are so many keys here. These uh, you know principles tie back to being in tune with your environment, knowing about where you live. So having a really strong sense of place. And my favorite, I think the first principle is to observe. And sometimes we forget how to do that. So giving us these reminders of observing where you live, really getting to know where you live, um, finding solutions that maybe take a little bit longer, but are considering the environment and the plants that live there and respecting biodiversity and these relationships. So uh, terminology that you'll see a lot when you're talking about plants, of course, native and uh, depending on what resource you use, that can vary a little bit. I just want to make sure that when you check your resources, make sure that they're like from really reputable sites. So my go to with native plants is, of course, the Florida Native Plant Society. They have some great definitions there. Um, and when we refer to plants, when we are speaking of native plants, those are plants that are part of the system prior to European settlement. So plants that were used by the natives here locally, that was the ice tribe. Um, and these plants fall within state boundaries. Sometimes they're very local. Maybe they're only found in Indian River County and then others could be a region in Florida, but have been here um, before there was uh, a lot of, of the Spaniards or just all of the explorers and treasure hunters, right? Um, this is limited, of course, based on accurate record keeping and current scientific knowledge. So the sometimes plant uh, species change, they reclassify and perhaps that could be a plant that they found was related to an introduced plant. And so just making sure um, that, you know, this designation is important, but we are limited with just some of our knowledge sometimes. So we do the best we can. And then non-native is a plant that Florida is not in its natural range. It was either brought here intentionally um, for like an ornamental purpose or maybe a food plant or accidentally brought to Florida. And then there are a lot of non-native plants in Florida. Our environment here uh, really supports and allows non-native plants and animals to thrive. We have a pretty mellow climate without a hard freeze, which allows a lot of these species to um, develop their own populations in Florida, which we'll talk about in a second. But as far as the term non-native and invasive, I just wanna make it clear that not all plants that are non-native have invasive qualities. So there are plants that um, aren't originally from Florida, but don't pose, say, a very large threat to Florida systems. But an invasive plant does just the opposite, right? So they're, they're not from Florida originally. They have really great adaptations or growth rates here in Florida that allow them to outcompete native species perhaps the even block growth of our native species through chemical action. And sometimes these species are very hard to control. Uh, I know air potato has been a problem. Brazilian pepper is a great example. The University of Florida has spent decades researching how to control this plant. So sometimes these invasives can be a huge problem. Outside of just like 
the growth potential and how they affect plants, of course, they also affect wildlife. So if they're out competing our native plants, that could cause a limitation of food, of space, of nesting material. So these um, implications of these non-native invasive plants, uh, you know, it's like a cascade effect. Sometimes you'll hear the terms exotic or alien and I think those are terms that are generally, we try to refer everybody back to using a non-native or invasive. Um, exotic and alien have some kind of inherent um, uh, connotations and it might trigger some other kind of uh, definition for somebody. So you will see those, but generally we try to, to use that non-native or invasive. And an endemic plant is uh, generally limited to a specific region. So it could be endemic to Florida. Um, the Florida scrub jay is a great example of an endemic species to Florida. Um, we also have a plant that's endemic to Florida and it's so specific, it's endemic to Indian River County, portions of it in St. Lucie County, the um, La Cala's mint and um, you know those species are are generally have some pressure whether it's human development or non-natives they can be really sensitive plants and species that we want to pay attention to and then introduced just means it was not brought it was not native right it was brought here for a reason whether that was um, accidental or purposeful naturalized. Uh, you'll see this a lot with reptiles in Florida. The non-native species was brought here, was introduced, and the species is doing so well in Florida. It's thriving. That is now naturalized and it is uh, has its own population that's reproducing in the state. Um, ornamental plants, generally that's a plant brought in specifically for a specimen plant uh, with the great value of beauty, perhaps not a food plant or a plant for pollinators, but mostly just because it's showy and it's beautiful. And then um, Florida friendly is another term you hear a lot about with um, landscapes and plants and talking about how we can be uh, stewards of the lagoon or watersheds here in Florida. Florida friendly, they may not all be native plants, but they're generally plants that um, work with our environment. So they may not need a ton of water once established. You probably don't have to spend as much time um, cultivating or growing them. And hopefully they don't require a ton of chemical use like fertilizers or pesticides. So now that we're on the same page, I wanna um, kind of delve into why, why are natives so important? Um, I think at the ELC, me in particular, I'm constantly pushing native plants and that's because I really love our wildlife here. Um, so native plants, you cannot beat them for how they support our native wildlife. Um, pollinators, you can see I have some great pollinators here. Um, our pollinators have uh, relied on these plants for for centuries, right? For thousands of years. And their, their pollen and the nectar of these plants are what's allowing these species to um, survive. And outside of that food resource, they provide a ton of shelter. So um, our native birds, our bees, uh, bats even, are using these plants for food resources and shelter. And so, you know, kind of thinking about it in a human centric way, because sometimes that's what you need to sell somebody on why these things are important. Um, if we didn't have pollinators, we would be in big trouble, right? Like we have crops that are grown here in Florida. Um, citrus has big, been a big industry here. We have strawberries that are very popular. People come from all over the state and out of state to go to some of our strawberry festivals. We have blueberry fields, central part of the state. There's a lot of growth with watermelon. 
And these crops bring in a ton of money for Florida. We have about a hundred crops here in Florida that are completely dependent on the insect pollinators that are in our state. And that economic value alone from that, those crop industries, that's about $20 billion to our economy. So, you know, that supports countless jobs, um, businesses, small businesses, that economy is really important to Florida. Um, outside of that financial benefit, of course, pollinators are helping us grow the food that we eat. So if we don't have pollinators, we're not going to have, you know, as many fruits or vegetables or nuts or grains to eat. There's some great images out there and uh, estimates of what your yield would look like with pollinators versus if you, if we lost bees and it's really jarring. So natives help uh, these native pollinator plants help these native pollinators do what they do and provide these services for us too. I think it's really great that um, one of my favorite things of talking about native plants and pollinators is that relationship that's evolved over thousands of years that the, the pollinators influences the structure and the um, you know, shape and color of the flower. And then we also have that selection pressure on the pollinators. So in this top photo is the giant sphinx moth. And you can see it has some really cool um, adaptations. That very large proboscis is its tongue. And this is a very specialized pollinator. Uh, recently, we found out this is one of the pollinators of uh, the famous ghost orchid. So over a very long time, these two species have evolved to help each other out. And when we replace natives with non-natives, that there's not a relationship there. So um, they might not have food resources for these pollinators, these animals, or perhaps their adaptation um, and the structure of their body, their anatomy isn't suited for accessing the nectar of some of these plants. Um, with these relationships, you see, like I said, these really cool adaptations. This is just one. Florida also has, I think it's like 30 type of bees that are endemic to Florida. So you see there's a few selections right there of all of our great bees um, that you can see here. Of course, having all of these critters supports a ton of biodiversity, these plants. And then we're also supporting um, natural cycles with natives. So, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on, but the water cycle, the nutrient cycle, migration and spawning, um, plants are supporting all of that. One thing that I, I like to promote is the benefit of our well-being by being in nature. I'm sure that you guys also know this. It's probably something that you practice every day. And so natives provide a ton of benefit to our life. Um, plants, wildlife, green spaces, blue spaces have these great effects on our um, mental well-being specifically. So they help just by looking at green spaces or being near water, it can really have these powerful effects on your brain. There is a study in, at Stanford, researchers were looking at how this group of people responded um, by spending uh, like 90 minutes taking a walk in a forested area compared to people who were on that same length of uh, a walk but they were in an urban environment. And the goal was to look at how our, our, the brains of these participants responded uh, to each environment. And uh, I'm sure that you can guess the, the person, the people out walking in nature had really positive benefits and specifically their uh, prefrontal cortex and their brain that was really highlighted and that's really important for our mental health because that area controls um, 
those ruminations that we get sucked into, often those negative rumina ruminations. So having access to nature, being out in nature helps us to kind of uh, relax, kind of take time um, out of our day to just be and to appreciate and to observe. Having green space encourages us to be more active, to exercise, to socialize. It also comes with uh, decreases in noise and air pollution when you have uh, plants around you. And um, a lot of these studies are also showing um, kids that, ha that are growing up in places that are primarily green have a much, um, uh, I guess, a, a very reduced chance of having uh, mental or cognitive impairment. So green spaces are super important for kids and adolescents growing up. And the dose is important too. So, you know, sometimes you do your sit spot and maybe you only get 10 minutes a day, but having, you know, a good three hours in nature a week is really important. Um, and so that's one way that I try to sell uh, getting outside, why it's important to protect these places. We truly are relying upon this for our health. Um, native plants are great at, you know, protecting our coast, our shoreline from storms, um, preventing erosion. And these next few slides, we're going to dig into specifics about how natives um, are so beneficial to Florida. What are some of those uh, ecosystem services that they do for our state? Um, so our Florida State butterfly is up there, the zebra longwing, and then um, we have a picture of an algal bloom. So we'll go into detail here, but some of the big benefits uh, to Florida from having a, a landscape of natives is that it helps protect and um, filter our water, provides protection from storms and shoreline erosion, and of course, it helps our wildlife. So specifics about water. Florida natives have evolved over a very long time to uh, adapt to our environment here in Florida. They can deal with our sometimes really dry conditions or super soggy conditions. And once they're established, they don't require much work. So of course you have to water them initially, but when their roots are established and they're grown, you really don't need to do anything to them besides basic pruning. Um, they get their water from our climate and they're naturally prone to um, having a higher tolerance for pests and disease. They also don't, regarding that, they don't require chemicals. So anything we put on the land is going back to the water and the less chemicals we can put on the land, the better for all of us and our resources. They also help um, filter pollutants, including nutrients and sediment. Sediment can be a polluter too. Um, these root systems for our natives, they're strong, they're deep, um, they hold on to the land. And so when we have a storm and a lot of water rushing through, that will help slow the flow, having these natives compared to like a landscape of turf. These plants will grab onto the water and that allows the water time and the land time to absorb the water um, for the water to infiltrate and to percolate through our earth. And that um, will also help recharge our aquifer. For protection, um, I'm, I, I know some of you take off in the summer, but I'm sure you've been through a Florida hurricane. Um, not a fun thing. I grew up here and it's just been always a part of my life. Um, and here at the ELC, we've been through quite a few hurricanes and have had very little damage because we're surrounded by this natural buffer of mangroves. 
So mangroves have an amazing ability to um, dissipate wind and storm surge from not just hurricanes, but say we have a crazy storm um, that blows through, that's going to help protect our, our resources. So the land itself is protected, but also our built environment. So our homes, our schools, um, with these natural shorelines and these natives, we have a great um, reduction and damage potential. In fact, there is a study that um, Audubon was part of, and it uh, estimates that having um, mangroves along the shoreline, specifically red mangroves, um, which you'll see at the that picture on the bottom there is a, a strand of red mangroves. Those root tangles are uh, lead to like a 50% reduction in storm damage um, and wave action. So they're impressive at breaking up those waves before they have the chance to make it to shore. Outside of a storm event, those really cool roots, those prop roots of the red mangrove, they work to kind of be like a little trap and they'll trap trash see it often um, as much as we do our best to pick up with a uh, influx of um, wind or if the tide's a little bit higher due to a full moon, we'll see trash wash up in the mangroves and um, catch it. It kind of lingers there until we can get to it. So they do a great job of collecting and stopping litter. They also help suspend sediments and uh, the lagoon is prone to having suspended sediments because it's so shallow and our winds kick up the sand. And so the mangroves help bring that sediment back down to the bottom, which helps seagrass grow. If the sand just stood in the um, water column, if it remained in the water column, um, the, the sunlight would have, um, the seagrasses would have a hard time getting sunlight. So it's really important that uh, the mangroves perform this service for us. And of course, the roots of the mangrove are um, excellent shelter for our native wildlife and aquatic resources like uh, game fish, recreation fish, um, aquaculture, our oysters um, and uh, clams. They're naturally growing on these systems, which provide um, resources for those industries like um, there's an oyster farm and a clam farm not far north of uh, the ELC in the lagoon. And of course, another benefit, um, we talked about pollinators, but outside of pollinators, we have uh, species that, of course, are dependent on these native plants and these landscapes to have food that obviously the manatee needs seagrass and they've had quite a hard year. The loss of seagrass has been um, kind of the talk of why we're seeing a lot of manatee deaths this year, that our lagoon uh, due to human activity generally with nutrient pollution, what we do on the land comes back to the lagoon and it can really choke the waterway and um, impair the growth potential of seagrass. And the, the manatee, that's a primary food source um, for, the, for these populations. Seagrass is like a huge part of their diet. And when they lose seagrass, um, they can forage on other species. They'll even eat mangroves. Sometimes you'll see them eating turf grass, but it's, you know, the quantity and pulling that body out of the water to grab grass or mangroves. That's a lot of energy. So seagrass is, um, when we see a reduction in seagrass, uh, it's, I guess, to be expected that we're gonna have problems throughout the food chain. And the manatee is, a, should be a warning flag for us. Um, the scrub jay here is an endemic species to Florida. This species is only found in um, portions of Florida, it needs our scrub habitats and it uses that to, of course, find its food. It nests in these habitats. And so when we um, 
cleared this land and then we replace natives with uh, general landscape plants, that's a problem for this species. And uh, it's a, a very social species and a very well-known species if you're traveling that you wanna see a Florida scrub jay. The birding industry here is huge. It's another one of our economic drivers. So keeping the scrub jay around is really important for our community. Outside of these two species, we have the Atala butterfly that's received a lot of, um, I, I wanna say news coverage in the last few years. Um, that species has one host plant and that's the Kunti, which has had um, a hard time because of our developing environment. So that land that the Kunti lives on, it's high and dry. It's a great place to develop a community. Um, and so that has created some pressure on the, the population of Kunti, as well as historic use of that plant. Um, but we're seeing a comeback. So people know about how important that this native plant is, the Kunti plant, and um, we're landscaping with that now. And we're seeing just huge populations of Atala butterflies now, which is awesome because at one point we thought that they may be extinct. And if you come to ELC in the summer, you literally will walk down some of our paths and you have to like part the butterfly uh, curtain. They're just like everywhere here. And I think it's a great success story of how when we're observing and paying attention and uh, being a part of this system, how we can thrive and coexist with these species. Of course, migrating birds also need these habitats. They are critical to stop to rest, to refuel. And these um, plants provide tons of food resources and of course, roosting habitat for them to rest. And so uh, I think you probably have a good idea of why natives are so important. And sometimes it can be a little overwhelming if you're not a plant person of how to get started. Um, the good thing is natives are pretty easy. They don't require a ton of your time or attention um, beyond having them uh, you know, established in your yard. So sometimes we talk a lot about food plants when we are referring to permaculture. So I wanted to give some options of plants um, that are native to Florida that are known to be great for edibles. Um, so the sea grape, I'm sure you've seen in our area, you can see this is the top picture. It has these um, grapes on it that are uh, really yummy and have been used um, by our native tribes that have lived here. They're used to make honey. The pollen from this plant has a specific honey. You can make jams from the, the, the grapes. You can eat the grapes raw. Um, and this plant grows abundant in our area and it grows easy. It's uh, very good at dealing with our coastal environment. So even, I don't know, 15 miles inland, you'll see sea grape growing. Uh, and it's a beautiful plant. It's rare. Um, the rare round leaves are really interesting. And even when it's not fruiting, it's a really beautiful plant. And then on that bottom picture, that's an American beauty berry. Uh, they're not so good ripe, but they do make a good jam and they have high levels of vitamin C. So it's also a medicinal plant in some ways. Um, we also have a mulberry that's native to Florida. We have a, a herb that's readily available in pretty much any yard in Florida, the um, peppergrass. Sometimes you'll hear that called poor man's peppergrass. It's a flowering um, grass species and it tastes a little bit like um, horseradish. And you can go out literally, I could go out and forage a whole salad um, for everybody here at ELC just by going out into our um, grasses here at ELC. We have a holly plant that's been getting some attention. The Yapon holly, um, native uh, I, locals, I guess, are using this plant now as a substitute for ca uh, coffee or tea. So this uh, plant contains quite a high percentage of caffeine in the leaves 
And there are a few um, places that you can get this tea now that's um, grown and bottled here in Florida. So not only are you doing good for natives, you're helping small business too. The hog plum is a plant that grows around our area um, and it's delicious. It's a little yellow plant and totally edible. Um, I like them raw. I, I haven't tried to make them into a jam, um, but those are really a treat when you find them. And then also Florida, our um, native grape is the muscadine that grows like weeds and it's easy to harvest. You can find it pretty much anywhere in Florida um, and it will save you a trip to the store. Um, and, you know, I just want to encourage you to, to forage, but also leave some for the animals too. So some great options for edibles. This is just a small list of options that are available um, readily. These are plants that you can find pretty easy in um, the landscape where you might be able to take a transplant or a native nursery. And then options for pollinator gardens that work pretty well in our area. I wanted to make sure that we are not just highlighting Florida natives, but natives that grow well in our area. So the top you'll see a plant, um, this Coreopsis, it's Florida's state wildflower. There's a, a bunch of different species. Um, this is the uh, Florida tick seed and literally it grows like a weed, but it's so beautiful. And it's one of the best pollinator plants that you can plant. It's really easy to find. Um, and it's the bright yellow color just makes me happy to look at. Um, on that bottom image is uh, the blanket flower, another easy to grow native that's adapted to the salt in our air and in our soil. This also grows kind of like a weed and it's beautiful when you have a field of blanket flower. Could see there's a bumblebee on that, um, uh, soaking up some uh, nectar and transferring that pollen. Up in more like an upland area, if you live near pines, you, uh, there are a variety of blazing stars and there are these giant purple flowers um, that grow like, um, kind of like, it looks like a cattail covered in purple is what it reminds me of. And then we have black eyed Susans that grow really easy. And I saw somebody in the chat also agreed with me that beggar ticks were their favorite uh, native. <laughs> awesome. So these also, they're an inconspicuous white flower, um, kind of the same structure as that tick seed. Um, and they, they grow with no work. They'll spread into your yard if you just don't mow for a while. And it's like the best pollinator plant. You'll see a variety of butterflies using that plant, um, uh, bees, other types of wasps. So it's really great for our pollinators um, and for you to just have some nature time watching butterflies. And then Stokes Aster is one of my favorites too. It's a really beautiful plant. Um, bright purple flowers. And so that's a great option um, if you really like that purple in your yard. So my resources, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a botanist. Everything that I've learned has been out of curiosity um, and hanging around with really great people. Uh, and so I wanted to provide resources to you, some of my go-tos. So if I uh, I'm curious about if this is a native or not. My uh, first resource is generally the Florida Native Plant Society. There is even a wonderful tool on that site. They allow you to search for a plant or to search for plants that grow in your area. And you, it's, there's um, different parameters you can set. So you can define what county you live in. If you're looking for something that has um, a, a tolerance for salt or really soggy soils. So a, a wonderful resource for us to access. Um, and then another resource, sometimes we get in these conversations at ELC is, is this particular species of um, um, 
plumbago is something that comes to mind. We've had a conversation about this. Is this a native plumbago? And the best access, the best resource that you can access for this is the Atlas of Florida Plants. It's um, part of the University of South Florida. And um, if you go in and you type a scientific name, it will let you know where it's established, where it's naturalized, is it a native? And so that's a really great uh, resource if you are strictly native and you wanna be very like precise with your species. The Florida Wildflower Foundation, you can get seed packets there, lots of great info on pollinator plants. Um, Audubon of Florida, the same. Of course, they're promoting a lot of work with birds, but they also um, do do a lot of work with natives. The Audubon Society the, in Vero Beach, the Pelican Island Audubon Society, they sell native plants. So another great resource to look into. And these natives, um, I tried to provide natives that were easy to access, but uh, one resource that you can look into to see if it carries a particular native that you might want is the Florida Association of Native Nurseries. So you can go on and type what plant you're looking for and it will generate a list of um, what nursery has that, what county that nursery is in, and then even like the options for that plant. Is it like a six inch pot or a three gallon plant? Um, so that's really great. I'm going to use that. I'm going to start just bought a house and the backyard is all grass and it's killing me right now. So like my, my plan is to just like get rid of all of the turf and have all, all natives. And I've been looking at that, uh, nursery list quite a bit, um, to find the plants that I want. Of course, none of them are that close. It's going to be a, a road trip. And then of course, ELC, if you wanna look at plants that are native that will grow well in this environment, you guys are really close to us. Um, the ELC has a lot of natives that are in different forms. So we, in, we have a portion of campus intended to show how these natives can be more manicured. You live in an HOA or you just like a tidy yard, you can come to ELC and some of, see some of these natives that, um, uh, you know, have been purposely pruned. And then most of our campus, the natives are, we just let them do their things. So you can see what they look like if they're just left on their own. And I think that's handy um, specifically if you live in a community that has, you know, regulations. Um, and so this is just a snippet of good resources. By no means is this extensive. Um, but I'm always here. If you have questions about natives, you can always reach out to me at ELC. Um, and I would be happy, happy to talk to uh, you about natives anytime. So with that, I know I want to save some time for questions. And I think, Terry, you're going to shoot some of those out. Absolutely. Sarah, thank you so much. That was such an information packed presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, if anyone has any questions, please type them into the chat box and we'll make sure we get them uh, asked. I want to start um, by diving into the world of invasives. And me personally, um, I uh, ha have a history with always having invasives on the properties I'm working on. And I lived on a river that was completely choked out by uh, uh, the water hyacinth. And we couldn't even get through the river. There was just so much of this water hyacinth on the river. And we eventually um, ended up using it as compost. Um, and it made such amazing compost, um, some of the top quality compost we'd ever used, um, that we ended up going further and further down the river to where eventually we ended up having to go about two miles down the river to even find water hyacinth because it was so valuable to us. And um, we also used it to grow mushrooms and mycelium as a medium. So I wanted to ask you, um, I'm sure you have uh, exotics and uh, invasives on your at the ELC. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the ways that you've managed to deal with them? And uh, uh, what kind do you have there on the property? That's a great question, right? Like my, it's hard to, I always try to stay positive. So like with natives, there's so much that I mean, we could have a whole nother conversation about invasives. Um, 
And it's important to talk about these uh, plants because they can easily take over if you don't let them. It's limiting your access to the water. Um, so not just damaging the environment, but you know, access to recreation, which is why we're here in Florida. It's amazing, right? Um, at the ELC, we constantly battle rosary pea. That's a, a problem that we have. Um, I would say more than any other plant, we're battling rosary pea, which is difficult because that growth strategy is to grow very, very high um, and then develop those seed pods and drop the seed pods, which grow really easy. So for us at the ELC, that's hand pulling. Uh, it's labor intensive. We have some amazing volunteers that are really dedicated and that's like their passion project. Um, we also have um, Brazilian pepper. We try before it gets uh, large to hand pull that. We have had to have people on campus to do like the, the, um, the cut and inject method. One, one plant that's driving us all nuts, there's an Australian pine in the middle of our mangrove island, like on the boardwalks. And I'm always like, that's where it's, I need to take like a um, bearing of it and just go tromping for it. Because whenever you get down, you can see it when you're on our perch um, and it gives you a great view of the area. And that one Australian pine kills me every time. So I'll go on the boardwalk and go try to find it and you're lost in the mangroves, you can't find it. So we have the pines, carrot wood is one that we battle along with pepper. Um, sometimes things are brought into ELC purposely without us knowing by a volunteer that's trying to do good. I think that's how we, we have the invasive porter weed on campus that we hand pull. We also have had a mother of thousands on campus in a pot. Um, and so even our volunteers that have been with us for years, there's room for more education there, you know, more sharing. Um, but typically our policy is that we don't put chemicals into the ground. Oh, I really appreciate the, the dedication of manual labor into removing mm -hmm. the exotic invasives. It can be a never ending task for sure. Um, so I appreciate that work you're doing. We have a question on how you plan to start transforming your personal yard into a uh, native scape. What is the, what is the first step you're going to take? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I'm so excited. Like the reason, one of the reasons that this house attracted to me, uh, that I was like pushing for this house. It was really like hoping it worked because the housing market right now is insane. We've lost several other houses due to other circumstances. And I was like praying we got this house. It has beautiful oak trees um, in the front and the back. It also has a ton of invasives. It's got arrow um, head plant growing up the oaks. I hope my neighbors don't kill me when I pull it. Um, and a lot of like, um, I think it's like India's princess, those plants are all over. I'm going to tear them up. It's my goal uh, for turf. I'm going to treat that and um, do probably like a cardboard treatment. But I have to say, my first step was to get a book from the library. Um, there's a great book. I was um, my personal like native plant. Uh, she's my goddess is, I don't know if you know Janice Broda from the Native Plant Society. So I'm always like, Janice, let me pick your brain. And she suggested this book to me. Um, and it's a step-by-step -step, um, guide to how to create a Florida native yard. And so because I'm not formally trained and truthfully I've rented my whole life, um, and so I haven't had the opportunity to plant a garden. And so I'm kind of going to be learning from scratch of how to purposely plant a garden. Um, let me share this in the comments. So that was my first step, which um, after I read this, I imagine I'm going to be doing a lot of cardboard treatment on my yard, intentionally killing the grass. 
Yes, that's one of my favorite ways is to go in and smother and then actually uh, reintroduce native species. Um, I have one last question for you, and that is um, large disturbed property that's been uh, either disturbed for development or wildfire. Um, do you have any uh, resources or ideas on how to uh, re-naturalize or uh, reintroduce native species into that area? That's a great question. I think, I think step one for me would be, I mean, it's hard to say because I don't know what the purpose of like clearing that land would be, right? But if it was my land and I was clearing it, I think, you know, if you give the non-natives, the invasives an inch, they're going to take a mile. So if you clear this whole property down to the ground and you don't quickly plant a fast, a fast growing native, there's going to be invasives there. You're going to co constantly be battling those um, uh, variety of invasives. So for me, that would be, you know, depending on where I'm living, that would be putting in some natives, even if it's something just quick to fill that space, like a blanket flower or um, tick seed or beggar, beggar weed. I think those are things that like, if you don't have a plan right away, getting those established to me would be a good thing. And then there are some quick growing natives like um, believe cocoa plum, it's really easy to find. It's fairly inexpensive and it grows pretty quick. Um, there's all kinds of like, uh, because we're coastal, we have access to like beach dune sunflowers. Those grow quick. Morning gl glories grow quick. You have to watch that vine kind of plant because they'll outgrow things too. But, you know, being strategic for when you're clearing land. Yeah, and be that step ahead of the uh, ready to plant right when it gets cleared. I think that is crucial. Thank, mm -hmm. thank you. I have one last question for you. We're almost out of time. And uh, that's about the uh, classification of native flowers. Like uh, there's a comment that a uh, blanket flower may no longer be considered native. And how is that decision made? Um, how, how do these plants go, go from introduced to native to um, off the list? Uh, is, there a, is there a process or is there a labeling? Yeah, so that native um, definition is you know, that particular plant species was here in Florida or wherever, if it's native to Montana, it was in Montana prior to European settlement. Um, so for us, that's like, gosh, 1500s. Um, and that's those designations. And that was a great comment because we had, um, it talked a little bit about in the beginning how those definitions and classifications of these plants are reliant upon well-documented history and scientific knowledge. Things change all the time. I haven't personally heard that about blanket flower, but I would love to look into that. Um, if you have a resource for where you heard that, that would be awesome. Um, and, you know, there are, there are blanket flowers in other parts of the country. And so making sure, which, um, I think is a valid point to talk about is to make sure if you are seeking these plants out that you are going to um, probably not a big box store that you're going to a nursery that you can talk to like are you sure that this is the correct native species uh, you know passion flower vine we have a lot of varieties passion flower vine and some of them are native and some of them are non-native and so knowing which particular species, not just the genus, but the species is native to this area. And I would imagine that conversation about blanket flower, maybe that's the, where that's going is that, is it, is this the correct species that's native to Florida or is perhaps that um, species entirely was that brought to Florida um, and per perhaps not native. Such a large uh, conversation, and I'm really grateful for you to be here having that with us today. Uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, efforts. Do you have any classes coming up at the ELC that we should be uh, interested in? Oh, yeah, we do. So if you have little ones, we have a program on the 19th of May, our Little Wonders program. Um, that's for generally for um, toddlers. So 
you know, um, up to probably like 18 months, I would say. And that is a free program. And that's on the 19th, which is not that far away. And then at the end of the month on the 24th of May, so that's a Monday, I'll be offering a um, forest therapy walk for the full moon. It's our second and last super moon. So I'll be out here. It's um, from eight to 10 at night. So you'll get, if you join me, you'll have like a um, free reign over the property in a sense. We'll be the only people here and often people don't get to see the ELC at night. So I would love to uh, welcome you and I hope I'll see you again. Oh, the nature trails under the full moon sound like a very beautiful time there at the ELC. Mm -hmm. So thank you for hosting that class. Yeah, and thanks for having me here. It's always nice to work with Kashi and um, you know, as presenters, it's great when we get that, that qu those questions that help us grow too. So I, I'm, I love that mystery. I'm going to go look at Blanket Flower. <laughs> well, we're going to continue this conversation in our Facebook group. Um, and that's, uh, feel free to ask any native questions and uh, really take advantage of Sarah's expertise and uh, talk about what your biggest takeaway from the class is. I really want to thank you, Sarah, for being here with us today. Thank you, Amy Zelt, for all of our production magic, making all the, the class happen. Uh, we wouldn't be here without your technical genius. And of course, thank everybody on the call. Thank you for taking the time, for being here, for being interested in reconnecting to the ecosystem. We wouldn't be here without your time, your donation, and your love. So we're glad to have you here. Um, we have a responsibility as designers and as humans to protect the ecosystem we're on. It's very common to come into an ecosystem as permaculturists and decide how we want everything to look, but we don't really have the respect for the native ecosystem in our mind. So before we tear up a system and just put in a nice, uh, beautiful system that you have, maybe take a second and observe and really look at what's there and how many plants and animals will affect by, by making those changes. And those little, little moments of uh, appreciation and, and respect can save thousands and thousands of species and generations down the line. Thank you for taking the time to think about this and we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye everyone. Thank you, Sarah.